that is great. Thank you, Ellie. I think a lot of you know that uh, over the years, our family has traveled a lot, and I think you know why. With our, young, our oldest son losing his vision beginning at age seven, and we knew it was going to be progressive till he was blind, with no treatments and there was nothing we can do except we said, where do you want to go? What do you want to see? Because we're going to let you see it, I promise. And so I was hoping it was going to be like I'd love to go like to Sarah's Chocolate Factory or something. I was kind of counting on a kid without real dreams. But to imagine, to see his face and to watch him climb into the center of a pyramid in Egypt, and the list goes on and on. It's quite remarkable. So I preface that to say the only reason we traveled was really for that reason. We were in, which is one of the most beautiful airports in the world, is Istanbul, Turkey. We were crowded in this area, and we were flying to Amman, Jordan, if you're familiar with the site of Petra. Grant wanted to see Petra, so done. <laughs> we'll take him. And so we're in this airport, and another young person that was with us, he's standing next to me. He goes, you know who that is over there, right? And sitting in this crowded airport, sitting on a golf cart, was a guy named Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo was a, a criminal uh, for many years, 11 years in prison, in San Quentin being one of those stints was early then after release, Danny was delivering something onto a movie set in, uh, in L.A., and a producer saw him, looked over, and, go, and they said, get him over here, and said, like, do you think you could act as a criminal? <laughs> Dan Danny Trejo said, like a professional. <laughs> And that began, he's, he's got more credits, some say more credits than anybody in TV and movies, 450 movies and TV shows this guy's been in. You've seen, if they need a bad guy, it was him. Well, there he was sitting right there. And I'm all nervous, and I'm like, I, I got to. I've got to go, and no one's talking to him. We walk over, and I said, Danny, as soon as I said that, he had the biggest smile on his face. And his eyes went right to the kids, and he said, Spy Kids, right? Because he was, he, was he was the bad guy in Spy Kids. And I said, and Machete, if that means anything to you. So he's had the gamut of movies, and I'll never forget how he grabbed his arms around Grant like if they were best friends threw his arms around him really tight with the biggest smile. In fact, truthfully, his smile was greater in that photo than Grant's. Might be because Grant was afraid. There's certainly the possibility of that. The truth is, when you meet somebody of any type of notoriety, you don't know the best way to respond. I, he didn't want to talk to, I don't even know why, why was he going to Amman, Jordan? That sounds like criminal activity to me, all by himself. I, I didn't know what to say. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. When there's somebody there in front of you, what do you do? How do you respond? Do you act like it's no big deal? This is the day today. It's Palm Sunday. This is the day that launches the greatest week in the history of the world. A third plus of the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about this one week alone. This is it. This is go time. And this week, Palm Sunday, today, as it kicks this off, requires a response because it's not merely historical. We're not just looking at an event that happened so long ago when you just want to remember it. No, people are still receiving him today. It's as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago at his very first entry. And what do we do? What's the response? And I'm going to suggest for us practical contemporary like today, what do we do with Jesus' response? I'm going to suggest three things of which how we can respond to him. 
But I first want us to read the passage. It's in Luke 19. If you have a Bible, if you want to scan real quick on your phone, you version or whatever you use, in Matthew or in Luke, Luke 19, starting in verse 29, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany and the mount that's called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples ahead and said, okay, go into the village ahead of you where on entering you're going to find a colt tied on which nobody has ever sat. Untie it, bring it to me. And if anyone says, hey, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who went away found it just as he said. While they were untying, somebody said, why are you untying it? They said, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, and throwing their, their cloaks over the colt, they spread their cloaks also on the road as they were drawing near. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they've seen, saying, blessed is he, is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, the glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, teacher, <laughs> rebuke your disciples. And he says, no, I'll tell you, if, if they were silent, then the very stones would cry out. Heavenly Father, would you please take these few quiet moments together that we have and allow our hearts to rest in you and your word. We have a lot of concerns on our mind. We're setting it aside. Allow us to think this text through and how to respond appropriately. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a look back up again to verse 31. It says, why are you untying it? And he says, the Lord has need of it. So they took this colt and took it to Jesus. And it doesn't sound real intimidating, really, at at the face of this, because this is the entrance. You get the big picture of what's happening. The Mount of Olives, as you're working your way down, the Mount of Olives, which is across a little valley from the temple, is actually two, more than 200 feet higher than the temple. So you actually, that's a favorite spot of Jesus. He loved to go to the garden there. And the reason is you look down at the temple. You can actually see the platform of the temple, even though there are walls, because you're above it. And he makes his way down, and then it's into a valley, and then up into the gate, into the temple. That's, that's the path. Well, they all knew this was it. This is Jesus. He is now being presented as king. This is exciting. It's happening right in front of us. But why on a donkey? You, you, can, you know what's about to happen based on what the king is riding. I want you to think ahead to Revelation. It's such a wonderful text. Revelation 19. This is Jesus. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. We didn't have to say that. He was on a horse. When the king's riding up on a horse, there's war. When the king shows up on a donkey, he's bringing peace. This alone should make our hearts skip a beat. He is coming back on a horse. Everything else he has said and the Bible has said that he's going to do, he's done it. It just keeps going. He's done it all. This is yet to happen. My money, if I'm a betting man, which I'm known to do on occasion if it's a good bet, this is a good bet. He's coming back on a horse. And he's going to judge. Isn't that nice of him to warn us? But right now, he's on a donkey. He's coming in peace. They gave him a donkey. 
So Palm Sunday gave him a donkey. Not sure he's in need of that today. What do you give him when he has everything? Do you have somebody in your family like that, that you don't know what to buy them? Because if they don't already have it, they literally buy it on Amazon the moment they realize they want it. Who do you have in the family? Is there someone? You don't have to name them. Oh, you named them. She, no, it was behind you. It was Sheila. Sheila's right. Oh, okay. Now dramatically pointing him out. <clears throat> if you order it early enough in the morning, you'll have it the same day. What do you get him? He has everything. Wrong perspective. Rather than look at him and see what he has and try to fill the gaps, you look at yourself. You look at what you have and offer it to him. That's very different. What do you have? Is some unique talents and abilities? God, they're, they're yours. I have no idea from working on a car to some type of medical something, to arts and crafts, you have a special talent and ability that not only are you pretty good at, you like it. Oh, God wouldn't want that. No, no. You open your hands. In fact, physically, a lot of times it's good to do that, to say, God, it's yours. I have no idea how this could ever work into your plan, but it's yours. Music ability, money. God, it, it's yours. It isn't much. But let it be known it's yours. You call for it. I'm going to deliver. Can you think of some New Testament examples of that? That they literally did that with Jesus? The widow, Jesus, I still imagine it as he's sitting on a wall with his disciples. They're just sitting there watching everybody. And they said, see that guy making a big deal about his huge check. It's a cashier's check. And so he drops that in there. And Jesus is watching going, yeah, okay. Guys, guys, check her out. They're like, her? It's a lepton, a mite. That's what they call the little coin, a mite also referred to as a lepton, which means small. So the gift, she gave a mite. She literally gave a small gift. And he goes, oh, is that nice? What? Because she gave what she had. I have an old preacher friend, Ron Dryden. Ron's great. His very early days of ministry, he was sitting in a church service with a, an old preacher friend. Offering plate goes by. Ron didn't put anything in. The preacher did. And, uh, and literally on the spot learned a lesson that to this day Ron repeats it. Guy said, kind of standard rule, don't ever let an offering plate go by without putting something in. And Ron's like... I don't have very much. You know, early on in life, I don't have very much. The old preacher said, then don't put very much in. And from that day on, and I, he only told me the story, Sarah, he was sitting with me in a church service, and an offering plate went by. And he's like, oh, yeah, let me. And he did. He put, like, even at this stage of life, he goes, i got to put something in I'm not saying that for us because so many do give online and we give all over. It's the principle of it. What are we to give? Yeah, money's part of it. The word tithe means 10%, and there are those that teach you give 10%. It's an Old Testament principle. I have Mormon LDS friends who have been called into the bishop to show his tax returns. They'll say it never happens. <laughs> it happens. 
but I'm going to, I will make fun of the LDS for doing it, but we often do it in just different ways, that you give a certain percentage. It's not a percentage, it's a principle. We're to give everything to him. It's all his. That's why it's the open hand. I don't have much, but it's all yours. You say, well, then what do you do? Yeah, then you you give back to yourself. You say, but I need it for these bills, and I need it for this, and God, what do you need? You say it, it's yours. It's the principle in the New Testament is a joyful giver, sacrificial giving. What if that's 2%? What if that's 80%? I can give you examples of both. God-honoring 2% givers. I know reverse givers. Have you heard of those? There's great historical ones. They're the ones that reverse give. They give 90% and live on 10%. How about that? But wait a minute. Is God more pleased with that than the 2%? No. It's in the heart. It's joyful giving. You have unique abilities, and so many of you offer that, not just here to the church, but to city mission and to your neighbors. You're helping out with things around because you're saying every day, every day we say, God, it's yours. Take it. Use me today for you. The little boy had no idea, no idea that him with his little packed lunch heading to hear Jesus speak would find out that that little lunch was going to be served, used to serve 5,000 people, right? It's not much. I would like a little bit back, though, if you don't mind. A little hungry. That's why he doesn't name a fruit roll-up, because he kept that. He just gave the fish and the loaves. The carrot sticks fruit roll-up. The kid goes, give me. I need those. You can have the rest. Yeah, anything in the hands of God can do what God can do. How about that? No, I'll give you a minute. You could write it down. I stole it. I'm sure somebody else said it before I did. Anybody in the hands of God can do what God can do. I think it was Henry Blackaby that said that. Let's give. What do we do welcoming the king? You give. I want to encourage you to do that, either as a family or on your own. Just simply take an assessment of what you have and say, God, it's yours. There are some practical good reasons for that, by the way, because money grows roots in us, and the more we hold on, the more roots it grows. We want it fluent. Just go. It doesn't matter. My life isn't dependent on that. We let go of it. We let it go. It comes, it goes. Talents, abilities. Your own family offering to God and say, however you want to use my family, we're here to be used. Take a look at the second point. It's praise. They were seriously improvising. It says, as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. That's verse 37 now. As he was drawing near, already on the way down, the whole multitude and his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. It was in Matthew 21 that tells us they were cutting branches from trees and spread them on the road. It's the palm part. We were in Israel on a Palm Sunday. I don't think this last time, the time before, and it's moving. A little showy, because you can't grab the whole mood of this thing. They literally saw him riding in the excitement that they're throwing their jackets on the road for him. They're literally trimming these palm branches and throwing them down on the road. They're improvising. I'm going to praise God. I don't care how and I don't care what you think. I'm going to show my praise and appreciation for God. That's where they were. That's where we are. Formally, here on a Sunday morning, we have a praise team who have hearts of gold. That's a huge win because you can't teach that. 
we don't have a leader. I mean, Mark, you're a leader, but you know, right? It, but you're like, uh, no, I would like a leader. <laughs> That's what they all say, right, Lori? It's like, who's going to lead? And music has the amazing ability to, uh, to offend and make everybody mad. It just has that beautiful ability to do that because it's not what we like. And you're like, ah, it's not what I would choose. You see what we've done on that? And this is where we, gotta, we reach into the depths of who we are we choose to praise and worship or we choose not to. That's on you. That's not on them. If they were just showing off and performing, I get it. I get it. They're not. They're doing the best they can, and they're doing a nice job. I thought this morning you reached that level of praise and worship. Do you guys agree with that? Did you sense that? There was that praise and worship level that you guys achieved today. And I'm grateful for that. But it's also in your own heart. That's a choice. I have left way contemporary. I've preached in the settings where the haze, and I love it. It's a fun feel. I've also been there, and it's horrible. Because the heart's not there, and I'm having trouble finding the praise. Always ends up on us. Do we praise and worship? Can we cleverly praise and worship? Can we improvise? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's an interesting phrase he said. If you don't praise me, the very rocks will cry out in praise. <laughs> I wish they'd stopped. Well, okay, hang on. What? <laughs> what? Because I see the rocks. Hmm? What he's saying is I don't need you to praise me. I'm going to get all the praise. My creation praises me every single day. I'm giving you opportunity to praise. If you don't, I've got it from somewhere else. You see, it's back to us. It's are we willing, are we ready to praise the Lord? Fanny Crosby was born in 1820. This, this sweet little gal was six weeks old, and she had a head cold, went into an inflammation in her eyes, and they put this topical treatment on her eyes, which led to her blindness shortly after. Uh, Her dad died when she was six months old, and so she was raised by her mother and her grandmother. Pretty prolific life. She died at 95. Pretty prolific life in... um, she was a member of Daughters of the American Revolution. She wrote on politics, did lots of advertisements. She wrote more songs and hymns than anyone even to this day knows because she would use pseudonyms constantly. So it's not uncommon where you even today could find a hymn traced back and they go, wait a minute, that was uh, copyrighted where? When? That was her. 8,000 hymns. You're looking actually at a picture of a woman who has wrote more Christian songs than anybody in the history of the church. I'm telling you that. I'm telling you a little bit about her because I want to read one of these many that she's written. And if you notice in the photo also, just kind of strangely, if you notice she has a book in her hand, she usually does. That a little odd. Almost always had a book in her hand. Uh, in fact, this one's even uh, cracked open a little bit, and of course, she has no ability to read. With that life of hers, listen to what she said. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him. Highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. 
if there's somebody who could complain and we'd listen, it's her. I'd, I'd take it. I'll sit for 20 minutes and listen to her complain. But somehow in our minds, and she is such a good reminder for us, we, we imagine that illustration of the life is, is it half, is the glass half empty or half full, right? She would be the example of the glass is half full because she's optimistic. As a believer in Jesus Christ, the fact that you're sitting here today or listening to me online, let's really just, just with no bias realize life is probably more like 95% full. I'm offended at the immediate, is it half empty or half full? I'm like, half? Are you kidding with the abilities that you have, the skill that you have, the finance, and you say, oh, no, I barely have finance. Yeah, you have what? You have some? Friends, the gratitude for Fanny Crosby to look at that and say, I just praise him. Look what I have. Look what I've done. Look how you've cared for me. It's 95% fool, but so often we're looking at the 5%. Me too. Yeah, thanks for all that, but there's this that's wrong. I have a health concern. I have an issue with the house. There's a relationship issue. My, at my school, I'm just, I'm not as accepted, and it's not going like, I, I get it. I get it. I want to live over here and praise him. And it's a discipline for us to get there. This is the third one. It's receive him. Verse 41 of that passage in Luke 19 says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you had known on this day, the things that make for peace. He knew he's going to be rejected. He knew this wasn't going well. Immediately, yeah, this is exciting, they're all, but as soon as there's going to be a little bit of friction, a little bit of pressure, they're gone. If only you'd known. John 1 says, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Right? It's the if they'd only known today, don't get caught up in it. I know things are happening. I know that it's confusing. There's things we like, we don't like. Church has all of this stuff going on. It's the very core of what it's all about. The very content of the invitation that Jesus Christ offers is that Jesus is God. He substituted himself as a sacrifice for you. He came, lived, died for you. Took all your punishment. Took the payment of all sin. And now the ball is in your court. Have you received Jesus Christ? Do you believe in him? Have you received him? I'm going to read another poem. I'm just a poem guy. Fanny Crosby started writing at age eight. So do you have an eight-year-old in your life somewhere where you could picture the little face? So a little eight-year-old. Was that third grade-ish? Okay. This is what she wrote, age eight. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I'm resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. What? What a relationship with God she has. It, it's a game changer. 
It's not receiving Baptist. It's not receiving a church. It's receiving the person of Jesus Christ, and he makes things new, free. He changes us. No matter what the problem or the issue that's facing, we have, it's now it's 99% full. I have all we can have, and some of the happiest people in the world happen to be in a wheelchair. Some of the happiest people in the world are in a prison cell <clears throat> because it has nothing to do with external circumstance. <clears throat> it's that we're separated from God because of our sin, and there is only one possibility of regaining that fellowship. There's only one, and it's faith in Jesus Christ. Fanny married another, uh, married a man who was also blind. They had a little baby, died in infancy, wrote an amazing song, of course, safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle chest, there is by his love overshadowed, sweetly my soul does rest. Can you just give her a kid? Give her some joy in her life to which Jesus would say, I did give her joy. Can't you read it? What do you think? You think joy is in a child? Oh, did you think joy was in that marriage? Do you think joy is in the car, in the job? Is that... Right? You can, you can almost, you almost feel the dialogue. You feel the tension. Are you saying that joy's in a certain amount in a checkbook? I, I'm not getting this. Then why are so many with huge checkbooks not happy? That doesn't make sense. It's the joy in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'll end with this, that, and it's so commonly pointed out, Five days later, from this Palm Sunday, five days later, they were silent. I don't think, I think it would be wrong, uh, really wrong to think the same people were screaming, crucify him. That's, that, that didn't happen. I don't know, did it? I, no, the bulk of them, they just slid away silent. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're just singing and yelling like little schoolgirls. They were so excited for him. And then the pressure came on, and they were silent. Which is why today's a good day for us to just simply stop and think. God, I want to give you everything. It's all yours. Start naming them. In prayer, with your hands open, you just start naming it. God, the money's yours. The kids, I'm so afraid something's going to happen to them. No, God, they're yours. I trust you with them. My skills, my abilities, give them to him. And praise. Is your day giving praise to the Lord? Man, do we, do we not whine a lot? Oh, it broke. Oh, it's all sad. It's sad. It's sad. Yeah, okay, it's sad. Yeah, and there's time for that. I get it. There's a time for that, and I'm there too. And I'm the, I'm the little one who's crying and upset, but there's a point in which we say, okay, back to big picture. Back to big picture. My Savior is amazing to me. If my life is miserable from here on out, it's still fantastic because I have him. Am I right? So many of you live that way. So it just it snaps us out. We're all over the map. This is that reminder to be back to appreciation. And then lastly is to receive him. If you don't know for certain that you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't leave until you know for sure. It's not a membership thing. It's not a us thing. It's a him thing. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? To talk to one of us, we'd love to sit, pray, and talk so that you can enjoy and appreciate receiving Jesus Christ on, on what a day, on Palm Sunday. Let's pray together. 
bow with me and pray. Heavenly Father, this has been a good day. We're grateful for the kids that played the bells for it's so fun thank you for that we've praised you we've listened to your word and now heavenly father i'm asking that everyone in this room knows for certain that they've received you and father we're offering ourselves to you every bit of us take us use us we give you praise and we pray this in jesus name amen